All right, the stream should be starting now. Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, I'm gonna need another three to five minutes to set everything up. Um, please, if anybody is already here, let me know in the chat if you can hear and see me okay. Uh, I was running a little bit late and now I have some technical troubles, but I'm gonna I'm gonna sort them out real quick and then we can start with the storyboarding 101 lecture in just a couple minutes. Um, all right, so let me see. <laughs> I need the chat first. All right. Ah, there are people on YouTube already showing up. Hello. Just a second, we're gonna start the lecture about storytelling in just a little bit. Uh, hi, I Isabella. <laughs> Isabella asked me to say her name. So hello. Hello, Luis. Hello, uh, Balu Bijayata. Nice to see you all. Uh, we're gonna start in just a second. I'm almost done setting things up and then we're gonna talk about storyboarding and how you can use it to make your production amazing. Um, all right, so got this set up, got the chat here. <laughs> Please no music, yeah. Yeah, Luis, the music was a little bit too much um, last time. Uh, and during my lectures, I will not have music. If I if I if I ever talk about uh, stuff where you need to pay attention, I'll try to to cut off the music. It's just uh, in these live streams, if we're gonna start working on something, I I will try to find the right balance to have a little bit of music in the background. But yeah. Um, Hello, oh, lots of people from all over the world. Mexico, India, really cool. Okay. Just a sip and I think I'm good to go. Uh, yeah, if you have any questions or remarks, just uh, feel free to post anything in the chat as it comes to your mind. Uh, I'll, I'll try to answer all questions. Uh, some questions I will probably only have time for at the end. So, um, but you know, if it fits to what we are talking about in the moment, I will try to address what is happening in the chat. Um, all right. Hello everyone and welcome to the Storyboarding 101 class here on Animator Island. Uh, oh boy, this is uh, one of my favorite topics and, and, and so much interesting stuff to get into. Uh, we're gonna talk about today, first, what are storyboards? Um, how they help you to have an easier film production and in the end also a higher quality film. And we're gonna talk about how with a storyboard you chase the best possible picture for every single one of your shot. We're gonna talk about framing, staging, and stylistic choices that you can make. Um, and uh, throughout the this lecture, but especially at the end, I will give you some simple tricks like, like really simple things that you can do to improve your storyboards a lot. Uh, my, my mind was blown away when I heard about these tricks and, and they've improved my storyboards ever since. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure there will be uh, uh, helpful stuff there. Um, who is this lecture for? Who should watch this? Um, of course, everybody who is creating their own animated film or just film in general can uh, benefit a lot from having a detailed storyboard. Anyone who wants to improve their visual storytelling um, and maybe if you've heard a little bit about shot sizes and all this stuff but you, you, you feel like you have to relearn it or you have to learn it for the first time um, then the part about framing and staging will be very important to you. 
And then, of course, the tips to make a storyboard look more impressive at the end. Um, probably going to help everybody who needs storyboards in their production. Okay, uh, most of you have probably seen a storyboard like this before. Here we have a storyboard from Jurassic Park. Um, there's a question from Bijayata, uh, what is shot size? And there we already have a very good example for this. Like uh, whenever you, you, you cut from one camera framing to the other, like this is one shot size and then here we have a close up and then here we move the camera again. Um, the storyboard is what shows how you put the camera in, in what moments. Um, what I find interesting about this Jurassic Park uh, storyboard, it also has little marks here, head and go motion. This is the technique that's going to be used to bring the dinosaur to life. In these shots, uh, they already planned it in the storyboard that for these uh, these two pictures for this moment they're going to use the styrofoam head of the t-rex and here they're going to use stop motion for the shot down onto the the t-rex so you can already see that um this is a very valuable tool to be used to plan a production Uh, I like to have a bird's eye view on everything, so I like to start with a definition. Um, what is a storyboard? A storyboard is the translation of a script into a series of images. And this makes it similar to a comic, but unlike in a comic, the images are used to show a visual preview of the final film. and. I think this gives storyboards a pretty interesting special position because they are not the end product. They are not, I mean, they are making offs and stuff like that, but usually this is not something that you give out to the public. They're just an in-between stage of your production. And um, they help you to make your production better because it includes stuff like the camera framing and the important actions. And these information guide the production of your film. So it's a tool that you can work with during the entire production. Um, the given as, uh, aspect ratio in a storyboard corresponds to the aspect ratio in the final film. In a comic, you would sometimes have a, a white panel, a narrow panel, and you would um, have a variation there. But in film, of course, you're always planning for that film format that your film is in. Um, then the way how dialogue and sounds are handled is that often they are written either under or bes besides the panels or and that is a lot of fun. They are often performed by the storyboarding artists when they present their storyboard. Uh, you can have arrows to indicate movement. For example, here in, in Jurassic Park, uh, we have a very good example of a very iconic scene, I think, um, uh, how arrows were used. Um, often, they are given a little bit of perspective so you can really see if something is moving around a corn corner, turning around, coming towards or going away from the camera. Then you could indicate with frames of what the field of view of a camera is. For example, here we have a, a camera motion which is going from position A uh, to position B and this is in classic storyboarding very often done with those bigger pictures that have all the camera positions marked in. Then there is another very important tool that we definitely need to keep in mind. It's an animatic and an animatic is basically the storyboard images cut together as a video. Um, often this has temp track music uh, voice recordings, often not by the actors, but you know, the storyboarding artists, they would do funny voices and placeholder sound effects to really sell the story. 
the storyboards are presented in different ways depending on well the times and the 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 production method um they can be printed out or been created directly on paper then you have the the panels next to each other like here um but one way of storyboard presentation that has been done for ages was to show the storyboards actually on on a board. Um, and here we can see how how this was done by Pixar's Toy Story. Um, you see there's an actual board with all the images there. And the storyboard artist is, yeah, the storyboard artist Thiago is asking about is yeah, and the storyboard artist would uh, uh, simulate the voices and sometimes do the sound effects. Um, there is this 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 great example of a Toy Story scene. Uh, you can find it on on YouTube. I'm gonna put all the links in the video description after this. I didn't get around to do this yet, but hopefully, uh, if you see it, this as a recording, you can just see the things that I, I share. You can click on it and see it directly as a link. Um, today, it's more common to present storyboards as a slideshow on a computer screen, because, you know, you can just you can just make your storyboard images, open them in the file explorer and just just navigate through one picture after the other. No reason to overwhelm yourself by putting all this the, the pictures at once onto a board. Um, now on the computer, we would just share, show one picture after another. Um, yeah, here I had an example of an animatic. No idea why this is not showing up right now. Um, reload my presentation. Oh yeah, uh, this was a scene from The Incredibles 2. And you can see uh, down here the final film and up there, you can see the animatic. Um, and it's pretty cool how in some instances, the uh, picture is really close. The animatic picture, storyboard picture is exactly how they did it at the end. And uh, sometimes they changed it a bit in the final product. The animator had another cool idea to uh, change things around a little bit. Um, so this is also a thing that I will link in the description. And um, yeah, you can see how the storyboard, how the animatic is going to be the base for the final animation. One of the biggest beginner mistakes that I see over and over again when I teach at universities is that <laughs> the students would put everything, like almost their entire project in just one shot. Uh, and this feels more like a theater stage than it feels like a movie because, well, you know, switching around the camera perspective is one of the most powerful stylistic devices that we have in film. And if you're not using this, you're not using one of the, the animation superpowers that you have to create good looking animation. So don't make the mistake to not cut in your animation, but think about the best way to present your animation and think about the moments when you need to switch cameras. Um, and that being said, uh, using different camera shots can also uh, save you animation time. For example, you know, sometimes there are things that you can do in close ups where you don't need to animate the the legs, you could just cut a little bit closer and then focus with your animation skills just on the on the parts that are seen that also saves you a lot of work. Um, okay. So please, anyone listening to this, uh, this lecture, um, I don't want to see you create animations where you never cut unless that is a very conscious choice. Uh, and then the other thing that I often get in regards to, to storyboarding, one of the biggest concerns is, what if I can't draw? And 
you don't have to draw to do something like a storyboard. Like you could plan your shots with rough 3D shapes in a 3D software if you're more comfortable with 3D. Um, there's a different name for this. This is usually called a previs, especially if you start animating and shifting the blocks around that you that you create. Um, and uh, yeah, there are also tools that can help you. Like here we have the shot generator that comes with uh, a free software called Storyboarder by Wonder Unit. And the cool thing about it is you can um, generate shots by uh, typing in how they how they look. For example, if you type in medium shot, it's gonna give you suggestions for a medium shot. Um, and yeah, it's really cool. You can make storyboards with this very quickly without um, the need to be good at drawing. Now, the reason why you should always uh, think about uh, or always use storyboarding in your workflow because it is part of a good workflow. Now, what does that mean? A good workflow can make a difference to your entire production. It can make your production faster, less frustrating, and more purposeful. And now I'm gonna tell you uh, what I think the main basic principles are that can help you to make your production faster, less frustrating, and purposeful. First of all, you should always work from rough to refined, to fine. Um, you shouldn't start modeling, animating, or programming before you know exactly what you do and why. So you need a rough preview, like a storyboard, and then discuss this storyboard. See what is working, what isn't working, and improve it. And only then, actually only after you've done this a couple hundred times, only then you should create in the final quality. Uh, this rough to refined workflow will always have you work in multiple passes. Um, and that leads us to the ne next big principle that I uh, can really recommend to everyone is to always have an eye on the big picture. Um, what you shouldn't do in a film production I know that there's some famous artists that do that, but you know, in Hollywood, in in, um, in 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 a lot of successful film production, uh, they don't work like that. That they first complete one segment and then they move on to the next one and complete that. Um, you shouldn't do that. Instead, you should go over the entire story, see that you got a preview of the entire story and then go over it again. And this way you can always keep an eye on how everything fits together and if the entire story feels good and is working. So every time you go through it, you can focus on a different aspect. And that is a huge benefit of working in uh, passes because the human brain is not smart enough to think about perfect composition, perfect posing, perfect storytelling, uh, perfect camera angles all at once. If you try to, to do the perfect storyboard the first time you, you, you start storyboarding a film, you will fail because we humans, we just don't have the capacity to think about everything at once. And we're gonna talk this uh, about this a little bit later too. Um, also very important, mistakes are part of the process. If your film isn't working, if you made a mistake, don't be ashamed this is good. Now you know what isn't working and that will help you to move more into the direction of what is working. Principle three of a good film creating workflow is to communicate decisions. Um, because with the walking through in passes of your production, you what you're basically doing is you're doing lots of experiments. You are 
trying it that way and then you're trying it this way and then you try to put a new scene in between and then you try to take out this scene then you try to put in this dialogue then you try to take out this dialogue you're doing lots of experiments and sometimes they will work sometimes they will not work and you need to move in the direction of a film that works better and better and you need to write down these decisions and decisions like that can be written down in a script, in a storyboard, but also in lists and plans. What props are we gonna build? Do we really gonna need this new setting and stuff like that? Those are decisions that you have to make and the storyboard can help you make these decisions. Um, and in this regard, the storyboard is both. It's a part of the experiment what is working, what is not working, but it's also the documentation of what you found is working. Because when you find out in a storyboard, okay, this is working, then you keep it. It also helps you to estimate the workload ahead of you to see like, okay, how many shots do I have? How many minutes do I have to animate? And this helps you to plan your resources and the steps that you need to take. And you have resources, even if you're not working in a team, the time that you invest is a very valuable resource that you have. You know, even if there's no money involved, um, you only have so many hours in a day. And this can help you make, make tough decisions. For example, if you, if you create your storyboard and you start estimating how long you're gonna need to animate this shot and you realize, well, with this style that I'm thinking of, I'm probably gonna need three weeks to animate that good. And then you go through it and you, you realize, oh, I would need 10 years to complete this film or something like that. Then you can make a very tough choice to say like, okay, I need to simplify things. I need to use a simpler animation style. Um, I need to simplify my characters so I can maybe animate, um, I don't know, 10 seconds in a day or something like this. Um, and this will help you to always know where you're standing. Okay. Um, and then when you have this plan, you can just chip away at the tasks and milestones that you have defined. So to uh, recap, what is the purpose of storyboards? With a storyboard, you can constantly test if the story, the choreography, the jokes, the dialogue, and the timing are working before you invest weeks, months, years of work into creating the film and the final quality. You can quickly see if everything works before you put in the real work. It communicates the vision and the expectation that you have, especially if you're working, uh, if you're working with other people, um, the way how I picture an epic fight might be different from the way you picture an epic fight. So as a team, you have to, um, yeah, to, to work on a common vision, to work on something where everybody knows what they have to do and how they have to do it. Um, here we have a little example where the uh, animatic was uh, followed very closely in the Gravity Falls intro. You can see that the cuts of the animatic and the final product match exactly and a lot of the timing matches exactly. Um, there you can see how they, they made the storyboard work first. The animatic needed to be perfect first and then they animated it accordingly. There are some little differences, which is pretty cool, where an animator was probably, hmm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna change the timing a little bit. Um, but overall, it's very, very close. And I could imagine that, especially for something like a TV intro, they probably had a dozen uh, dozens or maybe more versions um, to to get the intro just right. And then the storyboards serve as a blueprint. A storyboard shows 
who is doing what, how are they doing it, where are they doing it, and which camera framing, which camera settings we are using. And if you're doing it with an animatic, if you put the, your storyboard pictures into a video editing software and you turn it into an animatic, you can also judge what timing, when do you want things to be slow? When do you want things to be fast? When do you want to have a rhythm going? When do you want to break the rhythm, etc. Um, sometimes, not always, uh, the storyboards are more precise than a script. Now, don't get me wrong, there are very detailed scripts out there too that describe things very, very well. But sometimes uh, a script just uh, says something like, they engage in an epic sword fight to the death. And what does that mean? You know, everybody can picture this differently. Who strikes at what moment? How do they dodge in the sword fight? Uh, what will the camera framing be? And how will the rhythm and intensity of the scene will be constructed? And uh, here the storyboard can be an excellent way to give a preview of that. For animation, posing is particularly important. I don't think that for a live action production, uh, a, an actor would look at the storyboard and be like, oh, I need to, to position myself like that. They're probably not gonna do that. But for animation, if you already found some cool poses in your storyboard, you can steal them for the final animation. So all the work that you put in the poses in the storyboard is work that you have already done for the final film. And this gives you important planning factors. You know now the you know now the complexity of a scene or a shot, the number of shots in a given uh, setting. Um, here is a shot list that was generated from a script or a, uh, or a storyboard. And uh, this is probably for live action. So this is very handy to pull out during a live action production to know what you're shooting in what, um, in, uh, in what order and what camera setting you're using and how the audio is handled. Um, and, and stuff like that. Uh, here are all the possible things that could be seen in a shot list. Again, this is mostly live action for animation. It's also interesting though, uh, in which shot types we are using. Um, okay, and this is not the only list. They can be asset lists like what sets do we need to, uh, to build, which characters do we have, and which rigs do we need to create. Um, and then we have the props that needs need to be created. And uh, maybe we have special effects that need to be simulated with particles. And you know, they, they are a whole different thing to plan and estimate. This is also uh, something that can be created based on your storyboard. You see what your character is doing, you get a feeling for your character while you're doing the storyboard, and then you can create a model sheet. We are seeing here, of course, a model sheet of the Disney character Goofy. And um, yeah, this is very important so that every animator who is working on the production knows exactly how Goofy is drawn and everybody draws him the same. Um, because you, you, you don't want to see the individual animators. It, it should appear like one person drew it. And even in, uh, in 3D animation, first of all, you could create something like this to model your character before you start modeling your character. Um, but also you can make guidelines and rules how much you can distort the character, um, when you can break it, and how you can break it, uh, and all these things need to be defined in things like model sheets. Other important boards that you might or might not use in your production are mood boards. We have an article about this on Animator Island. Um, 
and you know this this goes into into more detail is it's basically you just uh, think about an aspect of your animation for example here i was thinking about um i, I was doing a, a animation with villains and i wanted to make a a, vil a classic villain song and on this mood board i was collecting reference for the colors that i wanted to use in my scene so this is a mood board where you pick an aspect of your film and you collect things that fit what you're looking for. And then you mash this all together and you create your own style for your film. Um, this is also interesting. This is a color board uh, for Finding Nemo um, where you can see that over the course of the film, the color changes depending in what settings the characters are in um, and of course it, it helps everybody who is working on the lighting and the textures to see how the mood is supposed to change over the course of the film Yeah, a little bit earlier we talked about how you should focus on different things for each pass of your storyboard and whenever you have a new idea or a change, that is already a, a new pass. Um, and this is also completely normal. Sometimes uh, people are very frightened by this. Like, oh, I put so much work into making, making my storyboard, but now I have a new idea. <sighs> and I'm, I'm not sure if I should really redraw all of this. I would have to do everything differently. And the truth is, go for it. If you have a new idea and you want to try it, throw your old drawings away. Um, that's why you are in the storyboarding phase. So you don't have to throw final animation away. Throw storyboard pictures away and try it in a different way. Um, writing is rewriting. That's, that's really, really true and important. One pass should always have one specific goal. For example, um, we have a little scene here where a small knight is provoking a troll, a bridge troll, to fight. And uh, our first pass is to just get the story across. And that's what we have here. We have uh, the little knight and we have the bridge troll. And yeah, we kind of sort of understand what's going on. Uh, this was the purpose of the first pass to just... Um, just get get that information across but it can be done a little bit better in this one i was thinking a little bit more about the camera where do i want the horizon line to be i want the the troll to be uh more massive to be really felt as this big presence in the room and you can see how this is already a, a, a step from this more symbolic okay there's a knight there's a troll to oh we have an actual 3d room here we have actual volumes in here and then i went over it again through uh, drew it a third time uh, and and tried to push the things that i liked about the previous one um and I think it's already pretty clear. Like I'm, I'm a professional. I'm working in this industry. I'm making hundreds of drawings uh, every week. Uh, but the best I come up with in the first pass is this boring thing. And if I draw the same thing three times, it gets much more epic, much more cooler. So I can really encourage you to draw the same thing, quote unquote, multiple times to try different poses, different camera angles, because um, you will find better ideas, better versions. Yeah, here are just some examples of what we could could um, do for a fourth pass. For example, if we could realize that we want to do an animatic, but we don't have enough frames. We want to have a frame where the club of the bridge troll is on the ground and then it's in the air. You know, then I might have to do a different pass. Uh, then maybe new character designs came in. The little knight is now a little smaller and we can now rework the storyboard with the final designs because we have a presentation at a film funding or something like that. Um, 
goal of pass six could be to push the poses even more. You know, the three images that I showed before, I was more focusing on the the camera angle. Maybe I can find better poses if I start working on this. Uh, and then on pass seven, I could push the camera angles again. And then I have another idea. The story changes and I need to throw that work away and do another pass with new ideas. Um, so I hope you get a feeling for how this storyboarding, this is not static. You don't do your first storyboard and then you start animating that. You have to do it over and over and over again, throw things away, change them, try different things, get feedback. That's also a thing that you could do. You could show it to your mentors to, 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 well, of course, you know, if you're working with a director, they will give you feedback. Um, but if you are the director or working on a project alone, it can be very valuable to show uh, animatic or storyboard to friends and family. And um, you have to listen, listen a little harder to what they actually mean when they give you feedback. But um, you might get a feeling for what is working, what is not working. You can ask them questions like, did you understand this scene? How did you understand this scene? And the storyboard is a very valuable tool for that. Okay, now it's getting interesting. Those are the visual choices. Uh, these are the visual choices that you can make or that you have to make in your storyboard. And depending on what you are showing, you have to make different choices. Now, what is the goal here with the visual choices that we have to make? First of all, clarity. It should always be clear what is happening. The viewer should always have an overview who is standing where, uh, where am I, um, who is saying what in, 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 in what direction and stuff like this. Um, that should be, this is a very, very important goal that your, your audience always have has an overview. Um, you, you should like next time you see an action scene where you then where you think like whoa this is a bit much uh, like what is happening here oh my god then this is usually because um, they lost you they did stuff that make made you lose orientation and it's really a high art to create action scenes where you know the position of everyone in the room. Um, Okay, so, um, but that's not the only thing. Of course, it should be clear, it should be understandable, but it should also be interesting. We should show unique images that stay in the viewer's mind. Uh, so they have a really, really interesting and unique experience. It should also be exciting. It should follow a, um, it, it should follow a certain um, tension. It should build up tension and relieve tension again. Um, you, you should constantly have, uh, yeah, different questions that you ask yourself as the viewer. How can I survive this? How can they get to the goal that they wanna get to? Um, And then, of course, I mean, especially in animation, but also film in general, in general is always an exaggerated and amplified version of reality. And it's, you know, even even a live action film that doesn't do a lot of a lot of crazy stuff. Um, what you have to do in films is that you turn inner conflicts into a visible image. Uh, like, you know, if somebody's unhappy with their life, um, it's not just going to be the acting. It's not just going to be that they say like, oh, I feel so lonely. I feel so sad. The camera and the colors and, and everything, they will support this. There might be symbols in this scene that, that, that symbolize this character's loneliness. Um, and we need to find ways to, you know, not, not only for the sake of clarity, but also for the sake of amplifying emotions, amplifying the experience, we should find uh, ways to to exaggerate reality. And now let's let's come to the very practical, the very practical, practical things that we can influence about our film and how we present our shots. 
first of all, we can play with the distance, with the distance to the camera. Those are the shot sizes. How close are we to whatever we are um, we are filming? And depending on what we, um, depending on how close we are, the picture will have a different feeling to it and will be uh, used to create a different kind of intensity. We have the extreme wide shots, uh, short EWS. Here we see one in Toy Story 3, um, which is, is, is pretty cool. Like we don't have any connection to any characters yet. We just uh, see, okay, uh, Wild West and a train. Like this is the information that we get from this shot and that gets us right into into a Western. Um, and yeah, this this is the establishing shot there. There's also an extreme wide shot here where we now see, okay, we are not in the, the Western anymore. We are in a, uh, in a no normal room. Um, yeah, in these extreme wide shots, the people are often very small. They're just secondary and the focus is on the environment and the setting to make it very clear where we are and what kind of genre we maybe have to expect from this film. Then there are the very wide shots. Um, here you can see we are uh, a lot closer, but the the landscape and you know the the obstacles that are in front of our character or that our characters are on uh, still has a huge part in this picture. It shows the connection of the characters to the environment. In a wide shot, also called a long shot or full shot, we see the character head to toe, and there can still be some headspace around them. Um, and it helps us to really see what action they are doing. And you can see how, how, how they play with these poses a lot. And um, yeah, makes it make it really clear to read what is going on with the full body. And it's often used for big, broad motions and for slapstick humor. Yeah, and that is the, the, full, uh, the full shot. Then we have the medium wide or long shot and they look like this. Okay, th those are already very close uh, shots. It could be a little further away too. Um, it's from the knee up and um, yeah, there's already one third of the character cut out. Here we are a, a little bit closer. Maybe this is not the best example because I also have an example for the shot where you go a little bit closer. Uh, which is the cowboy or knee shot. Um, and this, of course, comes from the Western, where it was really important that we still see the pistol holster of our Western heroes. Um, then we have the medium shot, where you have, uh, yeah, we see the character from below the chest to the head. And this is a very good example because it, 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 it's usually used to do both, to give you a closer look on a character's emotion, but also have you see what's going on around them. And, you know, because often the character is reacting to the environment and, and stuff like this. So this is a very interesting mix between we're a little closer to the character, but we still have a very good feeling for the environment. It's from above the hip, right on the chest to the head, uh, and the uh, environment still plays a big role. In the medium close-up, uh, can you see how the, the environment becomes less important now? Um, like that, that is the biggest difference when you go from, uh, from the medium shot to the medium close-up. Like here, the environment is still very important. And now as you get closer, the environment becomes less and less important and this is from from chest <clears throat> up to the head 
the environment hardly plays a role, but the subject still maintains a physical grounded presence. Now, if we go even, even closer, we have the close up. And in the close up, um, they start usually from the neck. They could also cut into the neck and usually also cut. Uh, cut into the head at the top a little bit and they put the focus a lot on the eyes and now an interesting effect uh, starts happening um, that um, the closer we go this uh, the, the closer we go the more artificial um, the 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 human face will feel like if you go closer and closer and closer you will start losing the feeling of the whole person and it will become more abstract in a way um i don't know if 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 you like for example if you if you stare at something very close like if you stare at an eye very closely it will will become this biological thing it will no longer be like a, a character behind it it will become almost like an abstract thing but still um, in in eyes especially, we can still read a lot of the emotion, or they are the strongest part often for reading the emotion. Um, yeah, close up from the neck to the forehead, often cutting into it. Eyes are often prominent as windows to the soul and to the emotion. Um, but of course, you can also use close ups to go closer to objects to to show a very important object that you shouldn't miss um, it's so important that you know it's 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 very clearly isolated from the characters um, then there's the detail shot or the extreme close-up and this was very interesting when I was going to th through Toy Story 3 um, I was half watching it half scrubbing through it I did not find an extreme close-up until midway in the film. There might have been one or two before, but really not a lot of extreme close-ups in Toy Story 3. And then in the middle of the film, there is an extreme close-up when uh, Buzz Lightyear enters the gambling hall of the evil toys and they start disassembling him and uh, then we get an extreme close-up shot of how they uh, they uh, screw a screw out of Buzz Lightyear and I found this very interesting um, because it, it, it really you know from the storytelling it is a break in this story uh, from now on things are going differently Buzz is becoming evil um, you know, there's a there's a break in the story, and it's accompanied by this break in the visual. There's a thing that is happening for the first time, and now multiple times in a row, uh, to really mark. Okay, things are different now. Things are going differently now. Um, this is also a thing that you need to to think about in your story. If you have a story that is going in different phases, like maybe you have a character in the beginning who has a very um, uh, a very happy and 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 um, comfortable life, but it's a little more stiff. It's a little boring. Then you need to think about okay, how do I transport that? Well, I could you know uh, always have things be symmetrical. I could always be further away. And then when this big event is happening that is changing the character's life, you could start to have cricket camera angles and stuff like this to, to show how the story is changing. Um, yeah, this was the distance of the camera, but of course objects can be uh, closer and further away to each other too. Um, for example, here we have one where they actually uh, uh, removed in 3D space. We don't have them be on the same line. We have him being in the foreground and the other character being in the background. This is a choice that you can make. Uh, as opposed to, for example, uh, putting them on the same line in perspective, but having them uh, very far removed from each other. You know, this, this makes very clear 
uh, who is on what side and uh, this is usually what you can use separation of characters for to show how close they are not only in space but also uh, literally are they they enemies are they friends stuff like that I guess that is figuratively then and not literally. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, here, I love this moment in, in Toy Story uh, 3 at the very beginning where you have this contrast of this very close uh, uh, train and then you have the exploding bridge, beautiful explosion here, uh, in the background. And then on top of this, the camera is tilted to you know have this, okay, now the ship is sinking kind of effect. Um, Really cool, really cool picture. Yeah, we talked about this earlier, how uh, closer camera, they also save animation work, especially if you don't have to animate the legs, that can make your animation speed a lot, um, a lot faster. So, you know, <laughs> with smart stylistic choices, you could save some work here. Um, then we have another thing we can play with, uh, with is the distance to the edges of the frame. And here we have a character that is very close to the left side of the screen and has a lot of space to the right side of the screen. And because, at least in the Western world, we are reading scenes from left to right, uh, it feels like this is very open. There's a lot of potential ahead of our little character. If we do the opposite, uh, we have a character who came from the left and he's now running into the, the right-hand border. Um, yeah, it, it, it has a totally different feeling. It feels like, you know, it's the end of the line here. It, this character is broken. He doesn't have the openness and the hopefulness of the previous frame. Um, then, of course, there are also ways how to create, uh, how to, how to, uh, put the composition of your uh, of your image. Where do you put the elements? And one of the most classic ways uh, to um, assemble things on your screen is the golden ratio. And this is a, a principle that comes from nature. You know, there are actual snails that have this as their their. Uh, a, a, as the shape of the house that they carry. Um, it, it's also seen in a lot of prehistoric animals. It's seen in a lot of, uh, like even minerals and stuff grow in this pattern. Um, and so this is, this is a, a ratio that we are accustomed to see and we can align our images uh, accordingly and they tend to look more interesting if we do. And we can already find another very uh, often used set of, of rules is the rule of thirds, where you um, divide your image like this and um, yeah, Bijayata asks, how can we apply the golden ratio in storyboard? Um, well, I mean, you could, I actually do that. I <clears throat> sometimes have this pattern of the golden ratio uh, ready to, as an overlay to, 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 to uh, put on top of my drawings and draw under them and, and plan with them. Like you can actually have that pattern put into your picture and uh, uh, draw, construct your image around it. Um, but more often I just have the rule of thirds. I have this grid and then I start assembling like uh, especially the eye lines um, so that they are in some way related to these lines or where these lines are meet. And this usually gives your picture a more pleasing kind of kind of feeling. And you will also do it instinctively. Like the golden ratio and the rule of thirds is so... Um, like it's a thing we see all the time. We feel drawn to this naturally. It's just when you realize something's off with this picture, something is weird, then it can help to put this grid onto your picture and nudge things a little so that they, they fall a little more onto the lines or where the lines meet. 
<clears throat> then there's also something we can use symmetry here, a very famous scene from The Shining. Um, and symmetry is interesting because it gives your image a sort of like artificial look a little bit. Like, you know, it, it is carefully constructed and it is in a way. Um, and, and it has this more of like a in your face feeling. And I don't know, it feels a little bit artificial sometimes a little bit too artificial depending on what you're trying to do but there's some directors like wes anderson here with uh, fantastic mr fox um who uses this masterfully and uh, every every picture like every time you see a symmetry like this in a in a wes anderson film like it, it's, it's it's a little bit of a hit um and uh, part of this big masterful construct um this is an interesting uh, uh, example. In Mad Max, they have a lot of action scenes. So what they did is they kept the framing, they kept everything framed in the middle so that you could cut from any picture to any picture. And you didn't have the problem that, you know, something was here and then suddenly it was on the other side and the, the viewer um, was confused and had to move at their eyes. So they solved this problem by saying, okay, we frame everything exactly in the middle. Uh, so the um, we can cut really fast and the audience watching the film, they don't have to shift from left to right. They can just keep staring at the center and see those very fast action scenes without getting confused. Then you can tilt your camera, which gives you different diagonal lines in your image. Um, here we have a, a very nice image of syndrome. I like the diagonal lines here that you have this very strong, uh, can I draw on them? I think I can draw on them, that you have this, huh, if my pen wouldn't be missing, Wonderful, so I have to do this with a mouse. But you know, this is also something that when, if you realize in your image, you have those diagonal lines, like even his head is not straight. Even his head is tilted to the left. And even in the background, we have this line and we just have all these different diagonal lines meet. Um, and yeah, this give you, give you this this great, uh, impression that something isn't right here. Something is uh, is going out of the 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 uh, supposed shape. Things are turning now. Yeah, here we also have a very strong diagonal line. And by the way, um, left to right diagonally is always like going down, always like things are going badly um, and f uh, going from uh, going f going down from left to right feels like, you know, something's going wrong and going from uh, bottom left to upper right has a more positive feel to it. Um, you know, you can also use that to give your pictures a different feeling. Um, this I also find interesting from um, Inside Out, where the mom is calling. They also could have uh, could have tilted, uh, not tilted it. The phone could just have been straight. But this is the moment where uh, the main character she doesn't want to listen to her mom. So it, it just makes sense to have the diagonal lines in here. And I love especially how this line is also cutting through it, um, which, you know, it's almost like uh, almost like crossing out the mom um, and, and gives us a little bit of a symbolic quality. Then what you can play with is the rotation around the scene. Here we have a full frontal view onto the characters from inside out and it feels different than seeing the characters from the side, doesn't it? Um, you know, here like we're directly drawn to their eyes and their emotions. We are wondering, well, what are they seeing? What makes them feel like that? 
um, we're kind of more involved. And here we're taken taken back a little bit um, to to see the conflict between those two characters play out and evolve. Yeah, and you know we were we were talking about the diagonal lines earlier here everything is very like there is some smoothness to it those lines aren't exactly straight but you know we are we're we're looking at them exactly from the side um and 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 everything just feels very uh stiff and 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 constructed and safe before you know things go uh go south in this film then there's the vertical angle of the character is if we tilt the character uh, the camera up or down um, this is often combined with the camera position where do I position the camera it could be on ground level it could be above my character and anything in between and depending on how we do this the horizon line will be different and depending on if the camera is looking up or down it will make things appear bigger or smaller than they really are and once again you know the horizon line this is very uh tightly tied to this how much of the sky do we see and you know how open does it feel in combination to this here we have another example lots of sky camera is on ground level looking up and making our uh, toy T-Rex feel really huge. Um, and here, just the opposite. The camera is directly above the character. Uh, the characters. We have no horizon, which gives the you know makes this image stand out from all the other shots that we had before. And it, it's giving uh, Jesse's uh, yodeling like this. 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 Uh, this powerful presence. Um, I think this is a really good choice uh, for this moment in the story. Um, the position and the angle of the camera can also be used to establish the position of different elements to one another. For example, we see here that Jesse is uh, slower than the character looking at her and um, in contrast we see another character and this character is obviously above her so we have like a, a, a camera position which is like the eye level of the bad guy um, but at the same time the angles give us information how tall the bad guy is and where everyone is in relation to that character and um yeah it's very important to do things like this like just little nudges like this just little nudges in camera tilt can help your audience to uh, have a much better orientation then of course there's also uh movement a camera can be static there can be a zoom um, zooms are interesting because they don't have a parallax effect in the background. If you look at the, the, the wall in the background, it's not shifting against the window frame. Uh, so a, a zoom like this kind of makes the picture feel uh, flat in a way. In comparison, if we have a track or a dolly shot, um, we have all this stuff in the background going on, like the foreground, the background, everything is moving, everything is shifting around. Uh, and this is what you get when you actually move the camera instead of just um, uh, instead of just moving the background and uh, the picture. And of course, in 2D animation, we need to be very aware of this, that by default, if we just shift the camera, we will not have a parallax. In 2D animation, we need to create stuff like that. In 3D animation, we get this for free and we have the choice. Do we do a zoom or do we do a dolly? Combined, you get the vertigo effect. If uh, in this case, they are moving closer with the dolly and at the same time zooming out. 
because they zoom out, you see more of the scenery. Um, and uh, yeah, this gives you this, this weird uh, feeling that one part of your image is standing still and another part is, uh, the background is moving uh, in a way that we don't see in, in, in real life. So this can also be used to put internal stuff um, on the outside. With the pan and tilt, if we just pan and tilt a, a, a camera on a tripod, we also won't have a parallax effect. To have a parallax effect, we need to actually move the camera. Um, then there's a lateral track where instead of going in towards the subject, we go sideways. Um, there's a crane shot, pedestal or jib shot where we move the camera on a crane upside down. Um, what I find very interesting in at Pixar, for example, they build actual virtual crane rigs to stick a camera in. You know, you should think that in 3D, you could just do whatever with your camera. You know, the camera can fly around, can be close to the ground, can be stuck in places where you could never ever put a real camera. But Pixar made the conscious decision, no, we're not gonna do this. People are used to television. People are used to how films were told uh, ages ago. So at Pixar, they made it a rule that the camera had to be realistic. You can't stuck ca uh, cameras on at impossible places. You can't uh, do impossible camera motions. You have in a Pixar film, the camera is stuck to a camera rig, to a crane that could exist in real life. And only then they animate the camera like that. Um, yeah, makes it a lot more grounded in reality, the whole film. Uh, there are handheld cameras where your image can shake a lot. Of course, in 2D animation, this would also be something that you have to painfully animate to get all the camera shakes. Um, then there's the steady cam used in live action productions. And um, yeah, this works with a rig where you make the camera very he heavy and you need to support the camera operator with this shoulder rig so they can actually hold the camera. And because the camera is so heavy, the, um, the impression of the camera movement is, is very smooth, like it's floating. Um, this is also something that you could simulate in your animated films. Yeah, we talked about this. Pixar only works with camera positions and rig movements that would actually be possible in real life. And it's really interesting to what extent they use this. Uh, we saw some pictures earlier from Inside Out and in Inside Out, um, they did a lot of interesting things in that, uh, for example, at the beginning, inside um, Riley's head, where all the emotions are, the camera is always on a dolly and on a crane. And um, then once um, Joy gets out of this safe environment of the brain, you know, where everything is in its structures, everything is ordered, uh, then they start having um, steady cams and hand uh, uh, um, and, and shaky cams um, to, you know, symbolize that these characters, they left the orderly tracks and they are now in uncertain territory. Um, so yeah, this is a thing that you should really be thinking about. Um, one of my favorite topics is symbols uh, in, your, in your images. Uh, here's Riley's first school day at the new, um, uh, they just moved and this is her first school day. And it is no coincidence that there is this, this wire here that almost makes it feel like prison. That is no coincidence that she is framed by this, that this is not open. You know, she might as well be standing on an open schoolyard. No, no, she's not. There's a wall here. She's closed in. That is no coincidence. Um, I love this one from The Incredibles where uh, the main character, this big guy, he's the only one with this huge column in his cubicle. Um, and that's really cool. I, I like this one too from The Incredibles where um, it's a shot from a car and you could fi film this inside the car. But here the decision was made 
to film it from the outside and to have the window separate the two characters. And, you know, that shows the conflict that those two characters have and that the mother tries to get through to, to the son and vice versa. But, you know, there's this, this wall in between them, visually and figuratively. So yeah, good symbols are dividing line, lines. If you frame areas in a certain way, if you stack characters into doors and windows or have them face a wall or the edge of the screen, uh, that can have a, a huge symbolic impact. You could also be more, um, more symbolic. Like, you know, if a, if a character's running out of time, there could be a clock over his head and stuff like this. There's this cool scene in Shrek 2, I should actually screenshot this, where they're eating at the dinner table. Uh, uh, and, you know, Shrek is meeting the family for the first time. And above his head, there is uh, uh, the statue of an eagle who is right above his head and has like his claws uh, out and Shrek is feeling very uncomfortable at this seat. Um, so, you know, you can have actual symbols for stuff like that. Uh, here's a, a film that I really like, The the Ballad of Poisonberry Pete. Um, if you Google it, Google it, you will find this wonderful film. It's, a, a, it's actually a student uh, film, I think. Uh, but it's pretty cool because the cinema cinematography is near perfect like how they change the shot sizes how they establish things in different ways this is also interesting that they, they started with this really wide outside shot here um, and then instead of showing a wide shot of the saloon they cut into detail shots of the saloon and all those details together they form a picture in our head of the Western saloon uh, and the person intruding. Um, yeah, and of course, all, all of the characters in this film are pies and cakes for whatever reason. <laughs> um, yeah, really fun film that plays a lot with the Western cinematography and uh, cliches. Um, there is an example for a symbolic storytelling that I wanted to show you real quick. Um, it's well first of all look at how the the sheriff is introduced like he is not introduced as the good guy and you know the way how he's framed and how the background is shown and you know the distance between a citizen and the sheriff like this is all no coincidence <clears throat> makes it feel very intense I love this one, the contrast of the far and near. Um, yeah, this one. <laughs> you know, it's it's very on the nose, but yeah, <laughs> you can do that. You can use symbolic elements like that. Um, then we also need always need to see things in context you know it's not like a painting where one painting has to be perfect and take us through a journey with just one picture in film of course we also have the context of what shots come after each other there's for example the classic exposition um, as we've seen in Toy Story with the Wild West train in Toy Story 3, where we see the train from very far and then we go closer and closer and closer. And as we are moving to a close-up shot, things get more intense. They feel more intense. Um, then you might have a master shot that is the overview that you always could cut back to. Often that's a long or medium shot. For example, it's all subjects of a family sitting around a table uh, and you always cut back to the shot where you see them all sitting at the table. That's a master shot. Um, you can have a montage of details. We saw that earlier when the in Poison, <clears throat> the Ballad of Poisonberry Pete, the saloon was introduced um, just by different close-ups. Uh, one of my favorite directors, Edgar Wright, he does this a lot in his movies. Um, for example, in Scott Pilgrim, Shaun of the Dead, or Hot Fuzz, he always has this compilation of detail shots. Um, <clears throat> then we have shot reverse shot. Uh, 
that is a thing that is very often used in dialogue shots where you cut back and forth between the same two camera settings um, whenever we want to see the other person speak. For example, this shot and this shot. It's also pretty cool because the characters have a different size that the camera has to be uh, below and and above the head to, to frame both of the characters. Um, again, no coincidence that uh, that the line is here. Um, <clears throat> so you can do that. You can cut back and forth between the uh, shots that you have. And then interestingly, in this scene, when uh, he accidentally says something about what they were actually doing, there's the shot that is not a shot reverse shot well in a way it is but now it, it's different it's just her it's just her emotion it's just uh, a, a close-up being like you did what um to to break the flow of back and forth and back and forth you did what <laughs> so that's why you need to have a look at the context and how the different shot sizes fit together that you are using <clears throat> Here are some storytelling tips from a storytelling artist who's working for DreamWorks, Rob Coe. Um, and here's his take on shot reverse shots. And he's also mixing it up. You know, there's a classic over the shoulder shot where you see over the shoulder of another character. Here is just the character. His note for this is to have the eye go slightly to our left or right ear. So we still make the connection that the character is looking at another character and not directly into the camera. Um, I really like this one, how when they bring Melman into the picture, how, you know, this, this shot, it, it gets so much perspective, especially because of the grid on the floor, um, makes it, makes it very interesting. Um, when you are dealing with multiple characters, you could group them and have a shot, reverse shot between the group like this. And then of course there is the 180 degree rule and the 180 degree rule is important for orientation. You should uh, have an axis that your characters are on and you need to pick a side where you put the cameras. You can also either put them on this side or on this side. But once you made a choice, you should not cross that axis. The reason is because if you put a camera here, she's on the left and he's on the right. If you also put a camera here, she is still on the left. Now we can see her face, but she's still on the left and he's still on the right. If you would put a camera over here, they flipped. Now he's on the left and she's on the right. And this can cause your audience to lose orientation. Um, and yeah, sh you shouldn't do that. You want your audience to, to keep orientation. And you know, even in a, in a, uh, in a heist or something like this, you could, um, have it all along this axis. Although, you know, they are traveling a huge difference, uh, a huge distance. The characters could always be on that, uh, on that axis. This is also amazing. This is an amazing trick. Like I have done this wrong a lot of times in my live action work. When I was doing live action and I wanted to have a closer, a close up, I would just pick up the camera and walk closer and put the camera down there and then film from there. But that is boring. You should change the camera angle between shots because that's much more interesting. Um, here we have uh, 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 an example from a Kung Fu Panda special where it cuts from this white shot to this shot. And do you see how how it, it has a certain kind of, of presence, a certain kind of physical, yeah, like despite the drawing and the lines being absolutely perfect, um, how, how good it feels that, that the angle changes and how it's... Um, like we see here that the character is very focused on something that he's he's seeing, but then the cut 
to this one really makes it clear that you know there's something in that direction that that captures his focus and I don't know just the flip from here to there very powerful very interesting um, then there's something called insert shots that is details that we can cut to for example a hand picking up an object we could be in the same shot reverse shot going back and forth and back and forth and then there's this one shot where the character is in a close-up taking something from the other character's hand and then we go back to shot reverse shot and stuff like that um, yeah and those are very often used for if you have to see a particular detail um, Here we come to uh, another important rule. Your cuts, whenever you cut, they should do that for a reason. The cut needs to be there for a reason. It should guide you through the scene in a very natural way. Only cut when there's a reason to cut. Here's a, another example from Rob Coe. Um, where we were with this character, you know, this character was doing something and there's a noise numbered here, there's a noise number one and then he looks over there and then comes the cut. You know, this is a reason to cut. We want to see what the character is seeing. And we do, it's a cow. We still have the um, the relationship between the characters, we see uh, we see the the man that we were initially with and we see the cow and to intensify this again there's a reason we want to intensify this we cut into the POV of the guy so we can see the cow a little bit closer and then of course we need to see the reaction of the guy and here we have something that we need for our animatic we need him to get up um, and you know the timing of how he gets up is important so we have an extra drawing for that now again we wanna uh, we, we saw his emotion we saw his reaction and now we want to see how the situation evolves between the two so we cut closer away uh, further away not closer away oh my god uh, and then they move closer together and because we were so far away we can now clearly see that again we need to cut the guy to show his reaction how is he taking that how is he reacting to that and the cow shoves herself into the frame and then we we have this nice intense stare where we see them both um, yeah this I think is is a very very important lesson that you don't cut because you feel you need some variation but you cut because your audience wants to see something or you want to show something to your audience that should always guide you um, yeah what design options do you have for your storyboard and these were the the more or less simple tips that I was talking about in the beginning that I was promising you that can improve your storyboard, how they look and how they feel so much. Um, one thing that I can really recommend is adding grayscale to your um, to your picture. You can see in, in contrast, if we take the grayscale out and make every lines have the same intensity, this picture is becoming messy. We don't know what we're supposed to look for. You know, all those things that we can later work with to put more light on the dog, to make everything a little more blurry that we're not supposed to see. Um, we don't have that in a storyboard. So we, we, we need to find other ways to do this. And one very effective way is to use shading, is to have uh, background lines be a little more transparent. and. Yeah, this this example is a, is a drawing from Michael Lester, also works at DreamWorks. Um, and I find it very impressive what big a difference this makes. Um, one 
recommendation is to use grids for walls, floor, ceilings, and sky. This is also a uh, a note from from Rob Co. That um, if you have just like parallel lines, this doesn't feel like an actual place. This doesn't feel like a, a 3D environment. Uh, and another mistake you can make in this combination is to have a character feel that there is a frame. Um, if you squeeze a character against a frame like this, that's that's not very good. That makes your viewer aware of that, you know, there is a frame that shouldn't be like that. Um, instead, what you should do, uh, you should think in three point perspective. And what can really help you to sell this in very rough storyboard drawings is just a grid on the floor like this and having the characters be set onto this grid. Doesn't it make it so much more interesting than the picture that we have before? Like this is is not a real place and this all of a sudden becomes a, a, a 3D place. Uh, use foreground, midground, background, far background to sell the depth of your images. Um, here you see some more examples. I find this so interesting. Here is also the, the, the wall uh, indicated through a grid. And there's just so much perspective in this little drawing. Uh, and it, it feels more like a window. It doesn't feel like, you know, something flat on the paper. It feels like you're looking through the paper into a window. Um, one thing that you should avoid is to just set your characters on a line like this. Uh, the infamous tight rope floors because they take out the 3D expression, uh, uh, the impression of a 3D space. Instead, you know, you should stack stuff uh, on a grid on a 3D grid floor. <clears throat> so yeah, to recap, bad is having only parallel lines, tight rope floors, squeezing too close to the edge, uh, and good is Use perspective, use foreground, middle ground, background, and place your camera at different angles. Uh, once again, a reminder, because we had this at the very beginning, um, use arrows to indicate camera movement or the movement of a character. And you can always draw in the camera frames to indicate camera motion. Um, what software could you use to create your storyboard drawings? Uh, you could, um, I also mentioned this software in the beginning, uh, it's free storyboarder by Wonder Unit. Uh, it has this really nice shot maker where it can generate shots for you that you can then trace over or, you know, use as a basis for your storyboards. Um, it's a very limited software. Uh, it doesn't really have layers. It's depending on what tool you use, you're drawing on a different layer. But if you worked, uh, if you used to work on paper, for example, if you used to that, you don't want to uh, have um, digital layers when you do storyboarding. This this could be really help your workflow. Um, there is professional storyboarding software, for example, Toon Boom Storyboard Pro. Um, which I I have used it for a couple of years and it is okay, but I I don't think it, it, if you are on a budget, um, I I wouldn't bother getting a professional storyboard um, software because you can either use that free one that I just mentioned or make storyboards in your animation software. That's what I like to do. I just put in layers, you know, have like a background layer, a character or element layer A and B and a foreground layer. And then I start storyboarding just on my animation timeline, I have one picture after the other. And then if I export an image sequence, I can export every single image one after the other. Um, so yeah, and I can show you an example in, in Toon Boom uh, for that. Because last time, last live stream, we already started working on uh, the storyboard for my personal project. Um, and 
yeah, this is like my, my favorite thing to just do it in a tool that I already know and use. I, I don't need a separate storyboarding software for that. Um, yeah, here you can see um, I have most of everything that is happening just on element one layer because it's one character doing things. So it's just all on that layer. But then we have a little bit of a background here. So um, for these, these images where we can see the background, I can just open up the exposure and continue with my main character over, over here. And you know, then same thing. I have just the character with his mouth open and he has really bad breath. And the bad breath has its own layer where I can generate some, some pictures with it. Um, yeah, so this was the humble start that we did last live stream uh, in an animation software. There's also, if you have Photoshop, uh, Photoshop actually has some pretty impressive timeline options now that you can use to make storyboards. So there are a lot of options. And uh, then of course, I also always like to start on paper. I think I have a paper over here. Yeah, this is what I usually start with. This is what I usually start with. It's like thumbnails like that. Before I even go to the computer, I uh, like to do little thumbnails like this. So uh, remember what we had earlier where I said that I need to, to draw things uh, several times for them to be good. Um, uh, and, and this is really good to do little thumbnails like this. They already help you to uh, get your first version out there and you know get your brain thinking and get the most important stuff on, on, on paper. And from there, I usually start my first version of the storyboard. And um, yeah, this is pretty much what I have prepared for this class. I hope it was helpful for you. I hope I could tell you something new about the the, uh, the usefulness of storyboards and how you can create amazing storyboards. Um, if there are any questions, I would love to answer them. I saw in the chat there, there are already, uh, already some questions. We're gonna talk about them. Um, just again, the invitation um, to ask now, and I will do my best to answer every single one of them. Um, Bijayata asks, what do layout artists do in storyboard? Um, so, in, you know what, I'm gonna get, uh, oh no, I lost my pen. <laughs> Where's my Wacom pen? I can't, can't draw right now. Damn it. Hmm. Where's my Wacom pen? Oh God, okay. Um, there are a few things that are created from the storyboard. Uh, you know, we talked about how all the shot lists are created, how an animatic is created, and then from the animatic there are shot lists created and asset lists and stuff like that. And one of the things that are created from that is the layout. And the layout has different purposes depending on the production. Uh, let's take Pixar, for example. Um, they do very, Pixar do very detailed animatics. Like you can already experience the whole film just by watching the animatics. You, you get an excellent feel for what is happening when, and they have some really good camera angles in the, um, in the, uh, in the storyboard, in just the drawn storyboard. But then they have an extra face where a layout artist, they look at the storyboard and the animatic and they load the background assets, they load the set, they import the character rigs, they import all the props, everything that they need um, according to the shot 
guides and lists and whatnot. And then they build it very roughly in 3D. They have like, okay, there's a, a camera uh, movement. So they already animate the camera doing that movement according to the storyboard. Um, the animator can change that. The animator can say like, I don't like how the camera moves or uh, now the camera's a little bit too high. I need it a little lower. Like the, the animator can still change that camera move but the basics are already done by the layout department. And the layout department also shifts around like this character is going closer and then this character is going there and then turning and then coming there and put those very important uh, beats in. And at Pixar, what they do is um, after they have choreographed the entire scene, like in Inside Out, there's this scene where the parents are, um, I don't know, are they fighting? I don't know, they're talking and Riley is on the stairs up there. The way how they animated this, they had a storyboard, but the way they animated is they animated, quote unquote, just very roughly the characters shifting places and Riley going up and down the stairs. And then they put in multiple cameras how you would at an actual live action set. You would think like, I put a camera here, I would put a camera at the top of the stairs, I would put a camera uh, looking above from Riley's shoulder, and then they would have the entire scene play out, and then decide, I'm gonna cut to this ca camera, and then I'm gonna cut to this camera, and then when this character says this, I'm gonna cut to this ca uh, camera. So they went a little bit further away from the storyboard. Um, Yeah, so this is the job of the layout artist in 3D. A layout artist in 2D, um, what they do or what they did in the past is they get the storyboard and, you know, the storyboard is a little bit messy. Maybe it doesn't have a clear perspective. Maybe it doesn't have a clear middle ground, foreground and whatnot. Maybe the background hasn't been drawn yet. So the layout artist tries to construct a little more carefully how big the characters are, like they're using the actual model sheet and, and they're, you know, they, they're placing the things roughly so the animator can start working from this and uh, already has a, a model sheet posed nearby. Um, I did layout for Patchwork Pals, uh, uh, BBC preschool series and it was very interesting there we were working with 2D rigs in Harmony in Toon Boom Harmony and what I would do is a little more similar to the job of a, a 3D layout artist I would import all the rigs that are needed for the scene I would animate the the camera and stuff like this and, and made sure that the animators had everything to just start working and think about the fun bits and focus on the motion um, yeah, so what other questions do we have in the chat? Um, um, Muchi TV says, please, can you show us a practical application of storyboard from conv uh, conversion from script? Ah, yeah, yeah, from turning a script into a storyboard. Yeah, you can watch the, uh, the live stream from two weeks ago or one week ago, uh, where I already started drawing on, um, on the storyboard. And I will continue that. Next live stream, we're gonna continue working on my personal project. Uh, I'm gonna get out the script again and we're gonna think about how we turn the script into a storyboard. Um, so you will see more practical examples next week. Um, how often do you, this is a question from Stefano Rolando. How often do you make an animatic? Does it depend on the size of the project? Um, well, you know, size in the sense of how much time do we have? <laughs> that, that is usually the limiting factor for me. Like, I have to confess, I have done projects that were so tight on schedule that I was doing the animatic and then we are immediately creating the animation from the animatic. And then there are other projects like my diploma project, uh, my, like when I was still studying, uh, uh, um, or usually, you know, for my own films, 
I, I mean, by now I have a very clear image in my head of how I want things to be, but I have worked on projects where we did like, just for that one project did like 30 to 50 versions of the animatic. Um, and I could imagine that for a feature film project, that is very little. Like if you see, if you see making of material of uh, like an Avengers or Marvel film, um, it, 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 th their animatics on the top right corner, corner, they say like version 378. Where I'm like, oh my god, <laughs> just, just. I mean, even if you just say changed a couple pictures in one version version 300 something that is really crazy um uh Bijayata asks when do I do live streams <laughs> yeah I try to do them once a week either Thursday or Fridays at around this time um but I you know sometimes I have so much to do that I I, I don't have time for it but I try to to do it more regularly and um, yeah, I will I will announce that uh, on our Facebook and Twitter. So check out Animator Island on Facebook and Twitter to be notified when we're doing something. Um, uh, first time watching a, a live stream, Vijayata. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, uh, I hope it will be the first one of many more um because i i'm gonna be doing more live streaming in the future um <laughs> soda pop says i refuse to use anything doom boom related or adobe it's so expensive it's just unjust yeah uh i have to say like i i was um i was working at a studio where we were using toon boom especially because we needed to rig things and toon boom is very good for that um but, you know, on the one hand side, those tools are worth their money because they have some functions that you only have in expensive software. But it's so amazing, all the free stuff that we have nowadays, like Open Tunes is pretty great. Like, um, and, and it is very professional. Like uh, with Open Tunes, you work Almost like if you have a frame by frame project, I would say that your workflow in Open Tunes is very close to the workflow in Toon Boom Harmony. And the thing that things that you can do for traditional animation, drawing frame by frame, Open Tunes is great. It has everything you need, um, but it's free. And Harmony costs like I don't know, a perpetual license is like thousands of dollars. Um, so yeah, you can just start with open tunes. Good enough. Uh, Soda Pop asked, "Do you like anime? Anime? If so, which one uh, of your particular favorite?" Uh, somebody also earlier said something about Studio Ghibli. I, I obviously I love all the Studio Ghibli movies. Um, and yeah, Hay Hayao Miyazaki. Also, uh, the storyboard is a very central point for Hayao Miyazaki. Um, by the way, he does not go through the entire story and then starts producing at studio ghibli they often start producing without knowing the ending uh hayao miyazaki still has to come up with the ending <laughs> which is pretty crazy uh it's like starting to drive a train without having all the the rails built uh but studio ghibli gets through it pretty well like they always manage to string it all together in the end and Disney and Pixar, not so much. They have some films where you can feel that they didn't have the end yet and they already started animating and producing. Um, let me see if there are any other questions that I missed. Soda Pop was asking uh, uh, transparency backgrounds for rotoscoping. Watching YouTube while animating? I don't know exactly what you mean. Um, but yeah, sure, you can you can also rotoscope stuff. I personally like to move away from rotoscoping. I love to have reference. I love my reference. I shoot reference myself. I take my phone out and act out a scene. You could also do that in storyboarding phase too. Um, just acting out a scene. Um, 
because it will give you give you I- ideas. You will uh, even if you're not that good of an actor, you you will realize how you know. Oh, I need to pick up this object, or oh, it's much cooler if I turn when I say this and stuff like that. So shooting reference just with your phone is amazing. Uh, but usually I do not trace stuff. Also, when I do uh, uh, like a walk cycle or stuff like this, I would pull up reference, but I would try to analyze what is happening and then copy that. I would avoid um, tracing because when you trace something, you get reality. But with animation, you want to get more than just reality. Um. Oh, some more software questions no parking berry ask about clip studio paint i've never used it for animating uh, i have done a little bit of illustrations in there uh i i liked it i, I had nice brushes and um uh i think there were some cool things about how they handled color and how you could use like shading layers and stuff like that it was a little bit odd that in clip studio paint you cannot fill vector layers i love to work in vector layers because i make so many mistakes with my strokes uh, i like to be able to correct the strokes uh, but in clip studio paint i think you have to fill them through into a bitmap layer i don't like that as much uh, but yeah i mean i heard that it has also pretty decent animation tools there i think they are limited to some like after a certain amount of time you can't animate in clip studio paint anymore uh, that's something to be aware of. Uh, that you can only have so many seconds in, in one file is what I mean. Uh, oh boy, more questions. <laughs> TV paint, Blender's grease pencil, uh, flip book. Um, open tunes, let me see. Digicel flip book, I think I think I had used that too, but just for animation exercises. I sometimes use Digicel Digi Flipbook because you know it's free. I used it in in some um, in some of my teaching. Uh, but like it had one thing that annoyed me. I think about keyboard shortcuts or something like this. It's definitely like, um, I have a video on the channel about software. Uh, and one of my biggest point in this video is that software matters less than you might think it does. Um, like e even professionals, oh my God. I was in studios where people said stuff like, well, I'm a professional in this software. I don't, ah, I don't want to start this. I don't want to, I, I don't want to even think about this other software. I was like, well, I could just show you the buttons and then you could, you could animate. Like it, it, if you already know one animation software, you only need to relearn where the buttons are. Like the important thing, your skill, that is the actual important stuff. You can learn what buttons to press. You can learn in this software, the button for the new drawing is here. In this software, the timeline is controlled like this. Uh, in this software, you get to the curve editor like this. Like you just need to relearn where the buttons are and you don't need to relearn animation. So I would always advise you to look at all the software and um, then when projects come along and job opportunities, you can jump on any job opportunity because you're not afraid of the software. Um, uh, so in that regard, try a software, see if you like it. And um, what also what happens a lot to me is that I am approached with a project and I'm like, oh, this project would be easier in Anime Studio Pro in Moho because Moho has some really cool uh, rigging stuff that you don't even have in Harmony. Um, uh, but other projects, the rig is so complex that you can only do it in Toon Boom Harmony. Um, or maybe you have a project where you combine 3D with 2D. Then I would use the Blender Grease Pencil, which was also, um, which was also mentioned. So um, 
But once again, you know, all these things wouldn't be impossible in the other software. It just would just be a little more pleasant. And if you, you, you have a lot of tools in your toolbox, you can always choose the right tool for the job. I think there was one production where I even switched. Like some scenes were animated in After Effects and some scenes were animated in Moho uh, because, you know, the scenes were easier um, in, 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 in the respective software. Uh, what do you think about TV Paint? TV Paint, really powerful software. A lot of people use it. Um, it has great brushes. Like if you want to emulate like charcoal, watercolor, like you, you want a handcrafted feel to your story, uh, to your to your to your animation, TV Paint is the tool to go with. Personally, I like vector software more because I like crisp outlines. I like to be able to scale up my characters, scale them down, manipulate the lines after I drew them. I love vector, but if you have a project where your style needs bitmap brushes, then TV Paint is great. Um, I had a few projects where I was like, we were animating in TV Paint, but it was like a vector style with clean outlines where I'm like, that was horrible. Like, why did you choose this software for this? Like, and you, you so often you had to correct lines that weren't quite sharp anymore because it's bitmap and you can't scale it up. And yeah, that, <laughs> I don't, I don't like that. Um, Bizu Pitsu is asking, is there any possibility of managing a scholarship to study at your distance academy? Uh, to, to study with me, yeah, I do have mentoring. I do offer mentoring on animatorisland.com slash mentoring. Um, and there you can, you know what, I can just show you. <laughs> um, the things that I offer right now is I have, I have pre-recorded video critiques and I have live sessions. Um, if you get a, a live session, you get a video call with me where one hour long we can talk about anything you would like, uh, about your projects, your ideas. I could have a look at, at your animations. Uh, we can discuss your goals and a training plan, come up with exercises for you uh, in a 60 minute video. Um, this is the, the live mentoring. But I also have a pre-recorded mentoring that is a little more affordable where you sent me uh, you sent me an animation shot or a script or a storyboard or an animatic and I record my reaction to it and I draw over it, I annotate, share my ideas with you, can also give you uh, tips and tricks about it and you can either get a 15 minute video critique or a 30 minute video critique. The 15 minute video critique should usually be focusing only on one thing because 15 minutes are really not a lot of time. For 13, 30 minute video critique, we can talk about a little more general topics starting from like the analysis of one of your animations. And I can also give you uh, tips for exercises, what you should do, what you should look at and stuff like that. Ah, yeah, Soda Pop, you were talking about a uh, fork of open tunes, Tahoma 2D. Really cool. I have I've never tried it, have not heard of it. I've heard about another fork of open tunes that has like even more features in there. Um, but yeah, cool. I'll have a look at it. Uh, Thiago, you see the price depending on where you are. You see the prices on Animator Island in euros or in dollar. Uh, I'm from Germany, so I'm in Europe. That's why I see euros on my website. But uh, yeah, if you're from the US, uh, all the prices are in dollars. Um, yeah. What else? There's a... Uh, Tahoma 2D, that's pretty cool. I would like to do more with Blender Grease Pencil too. Like I, I've not yet 
mastered it <laughs> only at like a quick experimentation session with it. And I think it's so powerful that now in Blender you can do 2D characters in a 3D environment. Um, that's really, really nice. Um, Luis asked earlier, do you think that in these times the storyboard has replaced the layout in animated production? Um, yeah, layout processes are often skipped now. We talked a little bit earlier about what that is. Um, but I think if you can, you should always have a layout process, which focus a little more on preparing the shot for your animator. Even if you're just the animator, I think it can be really helpful to first think about, okay, where do I put what? Uh, I get my model sheet. Oh, I get this model sheet. I put my background in and stuff like this. All right. Um, yeah, I think there are no more open questions. If not, let me know <laughs> if there's something very urgent. Uh, oh, we have time for one more question. Um, either way, um, I'm I'm so happy with so many people being so active in the chat. It was a lot of fun talking to you guys, um, and thank you for the for the for the nice words. Um, and yeah, so the way the live streams continue in the next couple of weeks, we uh, will not have a lecture. It will just be me working on my personal project. Uh, turning it from the script into a uh, into a storyboard and then into an animatic. That is probably um, um, uh, interesting for the people who are now interested in in storyboarding. Like um, uh, in a couple of weeks, we're gonna turn my storyboard into an animatic, and we're gonna use a video editing software to do this. We're gonna do this in Adobe Premiere. And I love already putting voices and sound effects in it and, and music, even if it's just temporary. Um, yeah. Um, oh, Soda Pop, you mentioned, you just mentioned Kakani as uh, animation software. I saw uh, 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 a crazy ad recently on Facebook where Kakani was was interpolating in-betweens and creating in-betweens. That looked so interesting. I totally gonna uh, check it out, uh, especially because I was thinking I could use this in the short that I am doing right now. Like I haven't decided on the animation style yet, uh, we're gonna do that. We're gonna talk about that too on the live streams. We're gonna think about what would be the best animation style. But I was always thinking like, ah, I would like to do a very fluent animation style. And I think with Kakani, I could make this possible. I could use that interpolation software to make really smooth animation. Uh, gonna look into that totally. Um, all right. Yeah, thank you all so much. Uh, I had a great evening. It was a lot of fun sharing all this stuff with you. And now, of course, I want to see some storyboards and animatics from you. So um, that's another thing we could do. Like, uh, if you're also working on a project um, uh, and I'm in a live stream, we could have a look at at one or two animatics. Um, and um, yeah, so just come by. I'd love to see you in another live stream. And I hope you have a wonderful day, evening, or whatever it is in your part of the world. And I'm looking forward to seeing you again in a live stream. Thank you very much for watching. Bye bye.